Welcome back to the dojo, everyone. I'm your host, Matt Lear. And here we are. It's July. The The clock is ticking down. And I don't know about you, but man, I feel behind the eight ball. I've got a lot of stuff going on. And not just like out in the woods. I've got stuff at home. I got to get a honey-do list, you know, finished up here because the season's going to be here before we know it. I'm actually going to Nebraska. I got drawn for it and heading down there for a week at the opener. And then it's just one trip after another after that and got to get ready for it all. So kind of feeling behind the eight ball, especially here in Michigan. I just haven't gotten out and did the scouting like I've done, you know, in the past. And really I've got two cameras out, I think, out in Illinois and nothing else anywhere. So really behind the eight ball and stuff. But anyways, hopefully you're a lot further than me. If not, then get out there. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to fight the bugs. I'm going to fight the ticks. And I'm going to get some cameras hung and definitely getting some glassing in because it's that time of year. I'm pretty pumped up about that. Feeling like my glassing game is, you know, stepping up a little bit this year. I've got myself you know, a uh, phone scope, and I'm excited to get out there and record some velvet. So this week, I'm super excited because we are starting a new series. It's going to run probably into the middle of August, and this series is going to cover different terrain and different regions of the country. Man, I've got a killer lineup for you guys because you guys actually helped me create it. I put out some questions, and people gave me who like their top hunters are in those different terrains. And I'll release a post here with the upcoming podcast, but let's get to this one. I'm super pumped for this. I've got DJ Riley here at the dojo, and you may have heard of him. Not only is he a big buck killer here in Michigan, but he is also the host of a podcast called The Method Podcast, and it's one of the most popular podcasts out there right now. It's one that I listen to every time it drops, and DJ came to the dojo to break down swamps for us. So without further ado, and I say this every time, but I'm serious, get out a notepad and pen because he drops some great info and super appreciative of him making the time to come here and do this, and I honestly think he gave us our his best stuff. So... So without further ado, let's jump in with the method man, the swamp doctor himself, DJ Riley. So we just got off the weekend. How was your 4th of July weekend, man? Man, 4th of July weekend, it, it was great because leading up until the 4th of July weekend, honestly, we we were down in Cincinnati, Ohio. My girls had dance nationals down there. And so we got back on like the Sunday, you know, so that was like the last day of June and then July 1st was a Monday. So we kind of rolled right into kind of a, honestly, like it was a little bit of almost a, a full two week vacation, but it was good. We, we headed up North for, for a few days. We have a place up on Higgins Lake. And so it, it's always a good time to get up there, but boy, it's, it's always so busy for the 4th of July. You know, my, my girls love the tube and out there in the water and we make sure we get out there and do that but if there's one weekend where it's like you you really got to stay on top of what you're doing and watch a lot of other people around you that's it man but it was a good weekend and you know i think with a a lot of people you kind of come off that weekend where it's like okay we did the holiday we did all that family stuff and then you start really gearing into uh, the into the whitetail summer work honestly yeah i mean the for me i felt like the the timer just like almost sped up. I think the timer's mm-hmm. always been going and, and I feel behind always on my mm-hmm. task list for what I'm doing for whitetail. But as soon as July 4th hit, it seems like it like just speeds up. And now I'm trying to get out and get more glassing done and trying to get through my list. So yeah, I, it's funny that you, you brought up that, that, that you said that you felt maybe you're behind and that, that is something that I've always battled whether it's, you know, postseason scouting, my summer glassing, trail cameras, or even going into season, I've always had that feeling of like, man, did, did I do enough? Did I get all my stuff done? But I've also along the way, I, I've kind of learned where it's like, I almost have this thought in my head that if I did, if if I was going into season and I was like, I have everything done, I don't have anything to do, then I almost feel like, I'd be complacent almost like, you know, it would, it would, I don't think it would feel right, you know, like, cause to me, it's like, it's never done. Like there's always something else that could be, you know, get, get 1% better. Yeah. I, I agree with that hundred percent. We, 
at the dojo, one of our pillars that holds up our mission is continuous improvement. And it's there because I think, I don't think guys who really live, breathe, sleep. I mean, this is our DNA. This is what we do. I don't think there is ever a time that you, you could get through that list because that list mm-hmm. is always going to grow without you even knowing it because it's that constant push to get better. Mm-hmm. So I, yeah, I mean, I, it's a stress. I actually like the stress. I like having this a little bit of like healthy, man, I got to get it done because it, it just drives you more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I tell you what, man, I, like I said, over the years, over the years, I've, I've like accepted like I, that I actually kind of want to feel that way because, dude, it used to drive me I and mean, I'm sure it drove my family crazy, too, years ago where it'd be like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it was, you know, back in the day, I thought there was this hard line of when green up started, like I couldn't scout anymore. And, I would, you know, I try to jam a bunch in at the end. And then then all of a sudden that would lead right into the trail camera stuff. And then all of a sudden it was right at the end of summer. It was like, oh, my gosh, like I, I didn't check them enough or, you know, or now it's just like, no, it's just part of the game. You got to You just got to take the, the ebbs and flows with it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel actually where I got kind of crazy was in season. Because mm-hmm. I just felt like, you know, I wasn't making enough moves. And for me, it was a little bit more wrapped up to like, I had to get it done mm. and it wasn't enjoying the process. And once I yeah. switched to enjoying the process, that little bit of stress like is, is welcomed. And, and now that's not a tied to identity. It's much more enjoyable. My family loves it a lot more now too. They're like, not stressed yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. I need, and I hear that because I, I used to have FOMO really bad during hunting season and that was more like that was a lot when i was younger and the the fomo was not being able to hunt enough that that's what i feared is is not being out there enough you know and and i i'll be honest matt like those days i can remember when i was younger like i was i was probably you know a jerk at home on those days that i was feeling like oh my gosh i'm missing out i'm missing out where now like you look i look back at those days where it's like man i hunt a lot less now but I kill a lot more than what I ever did back in the before, you know, and, but it's, I'm not the only one that notices it. Cause my wife always brings it up too, where she's like, <laughs> she was like, you know, you, you don't, you don't have to be out there all the time. Cause you, you still kill them without being out there. all the time. <laughs> yeah. My, my wife has been like, it's weird. We went through phases where it's like, Hey, you're out there way too much. And you're right. Like I had the whole FOMO thing going on, miserable out in the woods and then it got balanced and I was started to pull back. And now that our kids are getting older mm-hmm. and it's like, she's like, go, like you have yeah. time. You can, you can kind of go out there a little bit more now. So it's, it's this fun little support that she's kind of switched on. And it's been great for us as long as I keep it balanced. So it makes me like right now, one of the lists that I'm behind on is like honey do list. Yeah. Like, I, Cause she's supporting me like crazy out there during the fall season. So I'm like, all right, what do you want painted? What are we going to get done? Yep. And that's been, that's all last week. And that's what I was doing. But yeah, I, I tell you what else before, before we move on here, Matt is you, you brought up the point about that, you know, once you, and you know, learn to love the process and enjoy the process of it, like you felt like that, that pressure was gone. And I, and for someone that's new, just getting into hunting, I think that is so important. Like I, I've kind of talked about over the years, and I, I know I know every guy's situation is a little bit different. But man, when when I step back and look at it from like a hundred thousand foot view, and I watch guys, and and you, you see them like feel pressure, and, and some of the pressure I get it, like it's self induced, like it, you know you want to get it done. But man, I I just can't help but think it's like if if you're feeling a ton of pressure out there just to kill an animal. Like I, a lot of times I, I think that guys almost need to take a step back and think about why they're even doing it in the first place. Cause we all started doing it when we were young because we loved it. And it was a ton of fun. That meant you got to spend some time with grandpa or your uncle or dad or grandma, whoever it may be. And it's like, when you stick, take a step back and not feel that pressure and do things how you want to do them on your own terms, and enjoy the entire process of it, man, I, I think that's when it becomes so much more enjoyable. And honestly, that's kind of when things like you'd probably are naturally slowing things down at that same time. It's when things start to kind of fall in place for you too. But I, I love that you brought that up because man, I, I, I think in, in anyone that says they haven't dealt with that is, is probably lying because we've all de- 
felt that pressure before, you know, like, oh, my buddies are killing them or I got to kill one for a video or whatever the case my job is in the hunting and is all of that shit where it's like, man, if you feel that pressure, just take a step back and think about why you're really doing this. Yeah. And I, if, if you're listening to yourself right now and you feel like you have that pressure, go back and re-listen to what he just said. I mean, that is, that is gold right there. I think that right there will free people up to actually kill more deer than, anything Mm -hmm. else you know because when you get that freedom like for some reason everything starts to like kind of like get unsnagged and things Mm -hmm. start to make sense i think you just have a clearer mind and you can go in and see things differently with a clearer mind it's 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 weird and it's hard for people to really just take that serious they want to hear the tactic and they want to just teach me what i got to do so i can kill the buck that's it right there actually yeah yeah then you'll you'll enjoy the process yeah, I, I think that's I think that's one of the biggest hang ups, especially for me early on and in, in not not just my hunting career, but when I really wanted to get into uh chasing the bigger caliber box. And I and I know that was my biggest hang up is I was trying to, you know, trying to do things just like everyone else was, or I was trying to, you know, do things because of how it looked. You know, I seen someone else do it. So I tried to be just like that. And, and still today I think for a new hunter getting in there, like if if you just hunt how you want to hunt, you can take a little bit of everyone's style, and make it your own style or whatever the case may be. But truly, like doing things how you want to do them, when you want to do them, it, like success will eventually come if you if you keep after it. Yeah, I I agree. So today we have Jan because the idea was to go through over the next month, month and a half, and just cover different terrains. I, you know, I started thinking to myself like I love to travel, and there's been so many times where, for me, I'm comfortable with just jumping in the truck, heading to a different state, hitting a whole new terrain I've never you know, walked into before. But I also know that, you know, I've got a little bit more freedom in the later years. You know, I'm, I'm older than most, I think that I've, I interview and my kids are older, so I can go do that. And if I don't, if I'm not successful, I can go back later. I can figure it out. Yeah. I've got a little bit more time around this thing, but for the guy who has one week, you know, and, or maybe very limited vacation and he wants to make, you know, the best of his, his trip, out to a new area. I wanted to cover different terrains and I wanted to get people that not only that I think, but also my listeners thought were really the, I, I, you know, the experts on these areas. And, and I view you as an expert, definitely in, in the swamp game and other games too, but I wanted to bring you on and kind of start off by giving an overview, kind of what would I need to know and understand about swamps if I'm just showing up for the first time before I walk in as a new guy, what, what would you say are like, Hey, this is what makes swamps different than maybe hardwoods or different terrains that you've hunted. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words, Matt. They, they mean a lot. And, and I will, I will say before we dive into all the, the, the swamp things, there are a couple of things. No two swamps are the same because I, I, in, not only have I seen it, it's just something I believe because no two properties are the same. So every every swamp can be a little bit different. And what I talk about today, it may not be right and it may not be wrong. It's just, it's what I've learned. And, I'm, and I'll tell all your listeners, most of all these lessons have come from failure. You know what I mean? So along the way, I've, I've failed a lot of times and learned some of these, uh, some of these swamps of how they work. But so at the, at the, you know, base level, when I think of a swamp, I think a lot of people, you know, like even, you know, in this podcast here, we're, we're going to talk about swamps just individually, but there's a lot of things about swamps that I think relate to other trains. Also, they're just, they're, they're just in a different category. Like the label on them is a little bit different. So at a base, la- at a base level, let's think of a swamp as a rectangle we're going to try to paint people the best picture we can. So at the, you know, the very long lines of the rectangle at the top of it is the north side and at the bottom of it is the south side. So everyone paint a really good picture. Now, the thing about a swamp is there's edges all the way around it eventually. Now, what determines that is how big it is, right? And what kind of, what is it budding up to? A lot of the swamps I hunt, they kind of butt up to either farm ground, cattail marshes, or hardwoods. But either way, there's still an edge there, okay? Now, if you were walking into the woods today in in the middle of July here, it's going to be thick in there. But 
you should even be able to tell that that swamp's even going to be thicker, like visually, you know, whether it's that hardwoods edge to the swamp edge, because that means you'll probably you're into that that wood cover quite a bit. There's still going to be a hard edge there. So that's the important thing about a swamp is you got to always remember to me, these whitetails are such an edge animal. So there's going to be, there's always an edge there. Eventually, maybe that swamp runs into a road and then the swamp continues on the other side of the road. Either way, there's still an edge. But what happens with these swamps is, so, you know, I talked about a rectangle and obviously they're not a perfect shape rectangle, but let, let's say this, let's say on the Southwest corner of that swamp, you know, instead of a, instead of a, like a, a perfect square edge of a rectangle, maybe that's rounded. Okay. Maybe that's rounded right there. And when it comes off that rounded edge, maybe the swamp goes in a little bit right there. So naturally to me, when I start seeing breaks in the swamp, cause that's the, the number one thing that I'm attracted to is breaks in the swamp, something that it's not monotonous. It, there's some difference in it. You know, if there's a, if that swamp, you know, let's say it's, let's say we have a hard ed, or a hardwoods edge to a swamp edge and we're down there on that Southwest corner and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you're on that West side and now you're coming around to that South side and it's rounded, but then all of a sudden the swamp kind of goes in there right there. Well, to me, you know, now that corner, not only is it a corner, we have one edge. Now we have two edges right there. Now that corner is almost like a finger. Okay. When I look at that finger and how like you could think about it in hill country, it's basically a point on a ridge, just jetting out there. But what what the real important part is, is, you know, like when that, that swamp makes that break and it kind of goes in a little bit, that in is very similar to what guys talk about to me, hubs in hill country. Because when that swamp, if it goes in, if that that edge breaks into the swamp more, goes up into that bedding more, it's a great place for scent and thermals to sit there and just swirl right there. And I know I kind of got deep on like just one spot of that swamp, but if I was a new guy and I was wanting to learn a swamp, I'm going to take that rectangle I just talked about and walk those edges and look for two things, either areas that the the land goes into the swamp more there's a break in it or areas that the land comes out of the swamp more any type of break in that edge a natural one a lot of times the one that uh, i think is very overlooked and i've keyed in a lot over the last decade is these swamps you know a lot of times here in michigan at least we have a bad thing called emerald ash borer and so we have a lot of dead ash trees and boy, we'll have some really, really big downfalls on the edges of the swamps or maybe just inside. And if those downfalls break that edge where that hardwoods meets that, that swamp edge, that could create a really good break and it also enforce those whitetails to do something. Because the, the reason I'm looking for these breaks in, in the swamp is what I've learned is just outside that swamp edge say in the hardwoods and just inside the swamp edge where the bedding is, there's usually two parallel trails, one on the outside, one on the inside. Okay. And those parallel trails will follow that swamp. You know, like if that's a rectangle, so you say we're on that South side of that rectangle, they'll follow that thing the whole way. But every time I, I've learned this from scouting, every time I've walked all these trails, those whenever there's a break in that swamp edge, that is where the exit and entry trails are. And that is where like I I drop I I I use Onyx mapping probably the most out of all of them. And my most common waypoint I use is the junction waypoint on there. And every and they are getting dropped on the edges of those swamps where when I see a junction to me, that's two or more trails coming together. And if you look at, if you if I took you out there and I showed you every junction, you would say, DJ, every one of these junctions are on a break of a swamp edge. Cause that's just, that's what they do. They, that, that's, that's what a whitetail does. There's an advantage there to some point, whether it's, it's wind thermals or visual there, there's a reason that they eat, they use those breaks in the swamps. So with those parallel trails that you were talking about, mm -hmm. how are they using those? You said there's one on the outside and one on the inside. Yep. Can you explain how they're how they're being used? Yeah. So they're going to be used at different times of the year. 
I, you know, and maybe I should have even started with this about the swamps is these swamps are, you know, they, they can change. They change every day. They, I mean, lit- literally, if you go three days without rain, they're going to change. You get one good rainfall, they're going to change. So there's areas that like, there's some swamps that I don't technically have to go check the water levels all the time. I know nearby swamps that I can go glass from afar, say from a, from a truck to watch those swamp levels because those parallel trails are, are going to change with the swamp water because mm. that, that's going to dictate how, how far they're in because the whitetails don't necessarily want to have to live in those swamps. They live in there because they're forced to live in there by the human pressure or, or like even if you got real bad coyote pressure in the area, like they'll, they'll push them into those swamps too. But what happens, let, let's just say, Let's just say you're a new guy and kind of like the, the, what you talked about in the very beginning, maybe you had 10 days ago hunt and you're, you're in swap country and it's, we're, we'll even paint a picture of it. it's November 8th. Okay. And we have a Northwest wind and we have this rectangular shaped swamp. Okay. So a Northwest wind is going to put a buck that we're trying to hunt on that South side of that swamp. Okay, and he's probably going to be coming from the east, most likely. He's going to be coming from the east, walking west with the northwest wind, which will put him on the downwind side of that swamp, where he doesn't ever have to step foot in there until he smells what he's looking for. So that is what a lot of those parallel and trails are used for. And you'll see a lot of does use the parallel and trails. Outside of the outside of the the rut. For the buck that I'm after, the reason why he would use one of those trails is if he's slipping back in in the morning and he's trying to J hook up it up into that swamp. He'll he'll go downwind of where he wants to lay down on probably most likely on the interior of the of the swamp trail because he's already walked through the hardwood, so he knows he's safe there. Now he gets into the interior and he and he works downwind of it before j hooks into it into his bed that he wants to lay in and you know some people listening may say well a swamp is water like why would they lay in there that these swamps are water i mean so, some of the swamps i hunt they could be four inches of water some swamps i hunt are, are waist deep of water and it doesn't really matter to them how deep it is as long as their beds are dry and inside of these swamps, there could be islands out there, you know, like the size of a computer desk, or there could be a root ball out there, just enough high ground. You'd be surprised that what they will lay on to stay up out of that water. And, and as long as they can lay on it, they're safe. And, the, you know, the thing about the swamp, too, is I talked about the J-hook part of it for for his smell wise, so he could scent check that bed. Where a lot of times these swamps are so nasty, Matt, that honestly, they're not always wind based, in my opinion. I used to always think that, but we can get into why I, you know, why I don't think it's always wind based because these are, they're so thick and nasty and they're very noisy inside of there. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I was thinking when you're talking about the islands, and I, I think I know the answer here just based off what you just said, but. Are you ever pushing into those islands to to hunt deeper into the swamp? Are you, and I know it's situational, mm-hmm. but, or is, is the main focus out on the edges of the swamp? Yeah. So, so that all, that all depends on what the, the type of swamp I, I know was, I know of a spot I, I can kind of talk about that it's been a while since I've hunted it, but it's, it's almost where a swamp in a cattail swamp, cattail marsh almost meet. And the reason this works so well is because there's more than one island there. There's there's multiple islands in there. And you can kind of stage hunt your way back to the the farthest island. But to me, a lot of times are the island is only as good as the food that's gonna be on there a lot of times. Because I'm I'm not seeing them they're not betting like directly in the middle of this island. If there's an island I killed one of my bucks. And the last time I hunted that, I killed one in 2019 off that island. The very first day of season, walked in there, and I knew that the, the acorns were dropping because I spot checked it already. And he was betting, so I, I accessed it from the east, and we had like a westerly wind, 
you know, a westerly wind. Yeah, westerly wind. So I, I kind of had the wind in my face the whole time. And I knew I was so close that, you know, for an example, like I, I didn't even get up in a tree. I just hunted from the ground and I could hear that deer coughing in his bed before he ever got up and came in there. But, you know, that he was bedding like off the tip of it. And it wasn't even on the island. Like after, you know, postseason, I went and looked at it because that's, I mean, I I love doing that. Like after you kill a deer, just kind of going back in there and seeing what maybe he was doing. Where there was a little root ball that he was laying on that was probably 30 yards off that island. You know what I mean? And I don't think like that hunt never happens without it being really windy because you're you're constantly walking through water and whatnot. Now that was, I think that worked so well because I, I had a couple islands I could bounce to. I kind of started off with like the easiest, like closest one. He happened to be on that island. I think it was strictly because guess what island had some oaks on it. That one, the other three did not. So that was, that was pivotal. Now I've also hunted another, another swamp that has probably the best island I've ever seen on it. But we get that one happens to get a doe family group that beds there every year on it. And you can't, you can't get within like, it's usually depends on the leaf cover and vegetation. The closest I've ever got to it was back in 2012. I I killed a buck, killed him nine yards that in November 7th. But that doe family group was on the island. But I, I used that to my advantage. And I knew I set up where that buck was going to be working downwind of that island. Because he like if I knew the does are there, he damn well knows that the does are there too. So it's very I I know like it's the cop out answer. Like you said, it's it's very situational. But I I think you gotta you gotta kind of know what that island is doing. Is it is it holding some doe bedding? Is it holding some food? Some islands could be strictly for staging. Like I've seen that too. Where, you know, a lot of times I've learned, I've learned, I've hung a lot of SD card cameras on these islands and let them soak over a year, over the years. And it's just like, they'll kind of open your eyes where like some years they could be really good. Some years they could be really, really bad. But I've learned like that's very food situational. Now, what I, what I really love, if you got yourself an island that you can hunt, that's got some good food on it, you add that food with like a good scrape on it. If you want to kill one in like the first two weeks of October, that is, that is extremely, extremely deadly. Yeah. I asked the question because I think nowadays people are trying to judge like how aggressive they should be. Mm -hmm. And, and I found myself going back and forth until I've been able to dial it in for my own personal style, but where I've gone in trying to get aggressive, trying to get in and then blow out the whole swamp. Yeah. And, and cause I keep pushing in, maybe even trying to get to an Island that I see on a map and, and I get in there and it's like, I never see anything because they're maneuvering in a way that I can't even hear. Yeah. Them. Or I'm hearing the splashes as they run off, you know? Yep. And, and then the other, the other, you know, I guess the, the, the flip side of that is being so far back mm-hmm. off of it because you're afraid to get close to, to that bedding and get afraid to, to pushing them out. So, but I, I, I think a lot of conversation lately and I, and it might even be a confusion between a cattail swamp and, more of a wooded swamp is that, you know, kind of that beast style of hunting, you know, mm-hmm. getting into the cattails and pushing out back to the islands. It's the reason why I want to talk about it. Cause it's just not, it's not a prescriptive method that you can just use on every type of swamp that you walk up on. So yeah. I, I appreciate you explaining that and kind of talking through that. Yeah. Okay. Cause you, you nailed it, right? Like, you know, when I think about, you know, my time on swamp edges or just in the interior to the islands, I I spend more of my time on those interior edges of the the swamp. That's where majority of my time is. But if the island's telling me it's time to go, then I go. And there is a big difference between wooded swamps and cattail marshes. You know, when it comes to cattail marshes, that's what you're hunting. You're hunting those islands, at least for me. And I'm not, I'm not saying they're more predictable, but there's only so many places for them to go in in those cattail marshes. So that's why like, you know, that's why like your hunt could be determined on how many islands you have to hunt. You know, like if, if that, if that cattail marsh only has one good island for you to hunt, you better go find some more 
cattail marshes to hunt, not just that one. Where like a lot of these wooded swamps that I hunt hunt in Michigan, I mean there there is a rhyme or reason to what they're doing in there. But boy, they're I mean I they're almost these swamps are so kind of big and nasty at times. It's like you almost can't push them out of there. But you you brought up a you brought something up that I I I kind of wanted to also talk about today with with swamp hunting is you brought up you about the sound of of deer running through the swamp and that is a that is one of the very tough things about hunting some of these swamps especially here in Michigan when we have such high deer density numbers let's say you bump a, a bump a small buck or maybe a, a doe family group on that's on the exterior of the swamp and you bump them in there and you you bump those deer and they all do it. They all automatically run right to that swamp. Well, that buck that year after, when he's laying in there in that belly on his belly and he hears all that splashing, he knows something's wrong. And you just automatically most of the time kept that deer on his belly for the rest of the evening. So it that is that's the hard part of of put how far can you push? Like you you really have to know extremely where those doe families are because one doe family runs in there, he's gonna stay on his belly or he's gonna slip out the other side and you'll you'll never even know if, whether he was in there or not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess then what is the I don't want to go too far into because we're going to get into different times throughout the year because mm -hmm. what's interesting about you, I, I think a swamp, when I go out of state and I'm traveling, if I can find a swamp with that edge that you're talking about, I love setting up downwind during the rut. All I need is to see enough doe action, you know, like mm -hmm. when, when I'm going in to scout in to go, okay, cool. There's does here. They're bedding in there. I can sit on the edge and I can, I can almost count on a buck, you know, cruising down yep. downwind. But you're actually, you're getting it done early season on these swamps, which I think is like next level. I mean, it, it's almost, I don't want to say that it's easy. It's easier when you go to a state where the odds are stacked in your favor. And that's why I travel. You know, mm -hmm. if I go yeah. to, if I go to Illinois and, and, or, you know, even Wisconsin, I've been there hunting the swamps there, Indiana, I've had really good luck on the downwind side of swamps during the rut that the odds are stacked in my favor in Michigan. It's a little bit different. But even, I mean, early season in Michigan, you're getting it done. What kind of sign are you looking for? So you talked about these, these junctions. But for a guy coming into the swamp the first time, he may be used to looking for rubs and scrapes. Does the sign, does it, does it replicate what, it, what he might see in the hardwoods? Or does it look different in the swamps? Yeah, so it definitely can look different in the swamps. I'll have to I'll have to show you some pictures afterwards, Matt. That I've I've shared some of these pictures with people that usually just kind of blow their minds when they see it. But when it comes to rubs, the one thing you always got to watch about the rubs is, you know, when I, mean, I find those really big rubs in a swamp, you know, whether it's right in the, I love to find them right in the interior of that swamp because. It, because then I, I know for sure it's not just he wasn't just paralleling the out the exterior trail. Now it tells me he's in the interior. And usually if I can find one in the interior, it's going to give you a, a pretty dang good, pretty good dang I, good idea of his entry and exit. And then a lot of times with these swamps, like there, there comes a point where it's like, listen give me no water in them or give me lots of water because when there's lots of water like i can like you can follow them like if you ever watch like muskrat trails through like you know nasty like bottoms of the lake like there'll be all this kind of weeds and whatnot and then there'll be just nothing and that's a lot of what i i see in these swamps is those those big you know they they're big trails honestly that run through these swamps because they've been doing it for you know years and years and years i mean that's forever and there won't be any vegetation growing on them so when i can see like say a big rub right alongside one of those interior trails like that that's a that's a dead giveaway to me like he's especially like it just the the one-on-one of rubs like say you know say if we came in on that south side of that rectangle swamp that we talked about and we're walking south to north and we walk in there, we see a big tree, but then we kind of turn around and we look backwards. We So we are headed north and we look back south and all of a sudden we say, man, look at that rub that's on the north side of that tree that we just walked by, but we didn't notice it till we turned around and looked. That's automatically telling me like, okay, he's that's that's his exit for sure. 
he's using that for his exit at least. And but I'll, but I'll see those rubs like that. Now you might find some around their their beds, but it's it's so dependent on what kind of tree species they even have to rub in there. But when they're on that interior, right on that interior edge, right there, Matt, is what it is to me. Is is if anyone's ever watched an older class buck exit a swamp, if you can visually see him, like pieces of him before he fully exits that hard edge, what happens is a lot of ninety nine percent of the time I hear him sloshing through the water before I can see him, but I'm visually watching for where he's coming from. When he hits that interior edge, naturally, if I'm going to find a rub, some rubs in the swamp, this is where it's going to be. He stands there for a few minutes, and his ears are his ears are going back and forth. He's licking his nose. He's he's basically at that time of at that time of the evening. So it's an evening hunt. Every other deer has already exited, so he's listened for their reaction when they left. No, none of them blew. None of them ran. And he's sitting he's sitting right there and just taking all his senses in. And it's like this buffer. It, and that's where, if he wants to lay down a big rub, that's where I see it. It's right on that buffer of the interior of the swamp. So if you're looking for rubs, that's what I'd be looking for. Is I'd be looking in the interior. But don't look. Don't just look from one edge of it. Like, you got to wrap your head around these trees. Because I, I can't tell you how many times... Over the years, I've, I've tried to train myself to stop and look backwards sometimes because it's like there's so much stuff that I've I've walked by and I would have missed if I didn't stop and slow down and just look behind me and going, oh, okay, he's going, okay, this wasn't his, this isn't his entry into the bedding, this is his exit. Now I just got to find his entry. So that that's one thing I, I've tried to do. And then when it comes to guys finding scrapes, and I'm a, I'm a giant scrape guy, giant scrape guy. Now, the thing about a swamp is, like I said, the water levels are constantly changing. I've seen them waist high. I, I This is one scrape I know about. I've seen them be waist high, okay, with water. I've seen it as dry as a bone before. And no matter the water level, the leaking branches will still get used. And I, I can show you pictures of, of deer that maybe the water's four inches deep. And he's sitting there just raking the water out of the scrape with his hooves. I've I've seen it where the water's up to his belly, and he's still full neck, fully extended, still working the licking branches. So, are they as easy to see when the waters when the water levels are up? Absolutely not. You got to slow down, and you got to be looking for the licking branches. If you get into an area of a swamp, and you're kind of working some trail systems, and you get where maybe some multiple trails are coming together, and maybe the you may, maybe there's some blowdowns or some nasty you know nasty brush in the swamps that kind of force force them through an area. If you stand there and go, man, this would be a great spot. Like if there wasn't water here, this would be a great spot for a scrape. Maybe stop right then and really look at what branches are hanging down over the trails because it just one nip off a branch or one twist and it may just may just clue it away. Now, another really good example is maybe you're coming off a dry year. Maybe it was dry. Let's say it was dry in your swamp in 2023. Now it's 2024 and now you have water in there. Well, the thing about it, that dryer so maybe they did lay down a lot of good groundwork on that scrape where you let that water settle down from walking through it and kind of look down in there and a scrape will kind of look like a like a bluegill bed well in a lake where you can kind of see it's kind of it's cleaned out it's not flush with the ground around it but that takes like that you like you, you got, i mean you, you can't be like a for days like that, don't go out there and think that you're going to go walk 10 miles. Like you got to, you got to take your time to find those, those little, little, little details like that in the swamp. And outside of those two things right there, you know, you're talking about like, if you're going to find the, the rubs or, in, in, or the scrapes in, in the swamp and maybe even looking for their, their beds in there, cause their beds will actually stand out more than the other two will in a swamp. Like their, their beds year round, their beds are going to stand out really well in there. But uh, the one thing about a swamp is on those edges, let's let's backtrack out to the exterior edge 
where where maybe we're getting to dry ground. They can't hide a track, and they cannot clean all the mud off them hoofs when they exit those swamps. So a lot of times, if you're really paying attention, when they exit those swamps, depend on sometimes the water levels a lot. They they almost shake like a dog. And you you look on the side of uh, some of the the swamp grass or the trees are on there, or depend on what time of year. Maybe you have a bunch of leaves on the ground, where like that that mud. Think of a dog like a dog running through the water and all of or like how about this? You just let the dog outside and it's been raining all the time and it comes flying in the house and all that splatter goes everywhere and now you're stuck wiping it up. That white tail leaves that same kind of sign out in the woods. It's very minute. But if you pay attention, it, it's there. And and those exit trails, they're always muddy because they're like it's right on the edge. And the tracks can be exaggerated a bit because it is muddy, but he can't hide his track when in those uh those trails. And then those trails lead right to those junctions outside of there. So the sun that you're talking about sounds like it's right on that edge of the swamp where it meets hard ground. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now. As you back away, and the reason why I'm walking through this a little bit is I'm I'm trying to paint a picture of the level of aggression a guy may need when he comes to hunt a swamp. Yep. So as you're walking up to the swamp, you're on hard ground. I I would imagine you're finding scrapes back there as yep. well off of that. Mm-hmm. How much attention do you do you pay to those scrapes away from the the edge? So those those scrapes I'm paying more attention to earlier in the season, and depending on how far away from the swamp it is, how much I'm going to pay attention is I'm going to be watching what kind of uh, water levels we have, because the higher the water levels, the further away maybe those scrapes have my attention. The lower the water levels, the close like if it's if it's 200 yards away, then it's like okay, it probably doesn't have my attention too much. I need to push a little closer, so that the, the it's it's almost like this concept, you know, when it comes to like the swamp bedding stuff, I don't, like I said, I they don't want to have to be in there. They don't want to have to live in the water. They're forced to live in the water by by what by the pressure we put on them. So in the early season, that that's when it's easiest for me to push too much. Okay, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll I'll paint a, a I'll give you guys an example. The buck I killed last year. I was going to go hunt an island. Okay. This is a great example. An island that had a, an awesome scrape on it. Okay. And well, right as I start to get towards the edge of just the swamp, not even the island, the island's another like 150 into the swamp. As I just get towards the edge, the buck I'm after stands up and runs in, into the swamp. And I was like, there's, you know, I killed him on October 4th. And I know a lot of people sound, they may say, well, that's only four days in the season, but I expected him to have more pressure put on him already. And he just simply didn't. And so that's why to me, he wasn't pushed into that swamp just yet. Like I, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm really good at is like pressured style bedding. Like that is when it's, it's very predictable for me. Like when it's not, when, when shit's not getting a lot of pressure yet, it's like, it seems to be more randomized. So earlier in the season, I don't expect those bucks, especially after seeing that one last year, I don't expect them to be deep into that swamp as much. I actually think they're out there on that dry gown, just enough right on that edge, you know, where he can, he's looking up and down each edge of it, but he's mainly looking out towards whatever probably food source he wants to head to, whether it's oaks, beans, you know, alfalfa, whatever the case may be. But so this buck last year, he stands up and he runs directly into the swamp and directly at that island I was headed to. And instantly I just get pissed off. I'm just like, oh, yeah. I mean, you guys know how it goes. It, It seems like, you know, when you get a chance at a good buck, it you know it happens one time a year. Then you know here in Michigan, it's like man, that's that's probably it. But I I sat there and I thought about it for a second. I was looking at where he was laying. I, you know, I was like, I honest honestly, Matt, if I was paying better attention, I was so destination focused where I wanted to go to. I think if I was paying attention better, I could have shot him out of his bed. I he let me get that close to him, but I I just didn't expect him to be right there. And after I bumped him up, I thought, you know what? He's laying there because nobody's been back here yet. 
and I, I, I damn well know exactly where he's headed. Like that, that's one part of like a lot of scouting. Like I knew where he's headed. And if he was headed back in there, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do, I'm going to change it up. I'm not going to push deep in there. I actually, I'm not even going to push to the water's edge because I know once he runs, he's going to stop and he's going to listen because he knows he should, he should expect to hear me come into that swamp. That's what he thinks. I said, well, I'm just going to hold back like 25 yards off that, that water's edge. And I know where he, like he was laying right there. Cause I know what food source he wants to go to tonight. I'm just going to like, I think he might come right back here tonight. And sure shit, the only deer that come right back through there was him that night. And I shot him at like nine yards. But it was like, it, it was totally different from what I was thinking of that hunt. Like I was like, oh, I got to go to that island. I got to get deep in there. So my my thought process has changed a lot on on throughout the season, what they're how they're using those swamps to bed. But even even though he wasn't bedding in that swamp, you can bet your ass that when he when he felt danger and he dipped back into the swamp and he exited, which he used the exact same trails to do both, it was a it was what I'm gonna call when we haven't even covered this yet, it was like an inside corner of a swamp because the swamp make it made an L right there. Everyone talks about inside corners of like food sources and stuff. If I can find an inside corner of a swamp edge oh my gosh like you know you may not have a dip or a point coming out right there but it's you have multiple edges coming together that that's phenomenal and and if anyone's having a hard time picturing it let's get back to our our rectangle swamp that we we made and let's take this rectangular swamp that we did and let's take it to the northeast corner okay so along the top that's north so we're at the very northeast corner now let's put a, a, a cattail marsh that comes from the north to south and it meets it at that northeast corner. Now we have an inside corner right there, just like everyone that has, you know, a bunch of private managed ground, what they dream about for having, you know, a beautiful food source. We just now we're, we're letting Mother Nature create one of these in a swamp. And it's like, that's that's phenomenal, too. But the same it's it's the same concept. That corner is a break in edges it's got multiple edges coming coming together there but yeah so throughout the years i've, I've kind of learned if if the area you're hunting swamp country if it hasn't had a ton of uh pressure yet don't expect them to be deep inside that swamp just yet they're not going to be back there yet they'll get there from you hunting there they'll eventually get pushed down in there but they'll really be on the on the edges right there is it was what i truly believe yeah, so if you're on private land, you can kind of manage that maybe. I mean, if you've got permission on private land, it, it could be just as busy as public. So you could start off early season kind of back from the edge and work your way slowly in. Do you agree with that? I mean, because is yeah, there I, I, I would say of, so. I would say so. You know, no one, you got to know where, you got to know where they want to head to after, after the, after they exit the swamp, right? You got to kind of know what destination food source they want to go to. It may be pretty close, maybe pretty far, depends on what kind of, you know, does that swamp country, is it, but, is it budding right up to farm country? And if it is, do this. You can go out right now in the summertime and, and glass deer. And if you're close to swamp country, look at, the bottom half of their legs, it is going to tell you whether they're bedding in water or they're not. Because if they're if they're bedding in water, I'm not saying bedding in the water, they're bedding inside a swamp, having to walk through that water. Most of these swamps, they're dirty and they're going to be black. And that will give you a really good indication. If you don't, if you say, if you're like, well, I can't glass my food source, Go out there and walk that bean edge because that same muddy water that's going to be stuck to the bottom half of their leg will be wiped all over the very first couple of rows of beans as they walk into them. That will tell you if they're inside of that uh, inside of the swamp edge. So yeah, so it, it knowing where they want to go to to eat that night, and it's kind of like you you know you you got to kind of learn. How, you got to you have to bump some of these deer sometimes. That, that's how you're going to learn. Like. What I like I said in the beginning, a lot of what I've talked about is from a lot of failures along the way, kind of knowing how close I can get 
or how far off I need to lay off. And a lot of times it, like, that means constantly staying on top of what the water level is. Because if that water level's down, they're going to be down in there farther. That water level's up, they're going to be pushed maybe out to that food source a little closer. But no one, no one, you know, no one what that food source is. This might, this is what I love. This is honestly, this is my early season game right here. Knowing the swamp where that bedding edge is going to be, knowing where the food source is, and I mean, I a lot of times in that that very that very first scrape outside of their bedding area along that junction that is that is my like i love that for early season i i when they exit that bedding area i want the first thing they want to stop at i'm looking for that scrape that's that's what i'm looking for yeah so moving on from from early season well is there anything else about early season we should we should say before we move on no i don't not not the, nothing that I can think about. You know, the the only other thing I would I would I'd maybe hit on about early season is say say if you've been scouting a swamp area and <clears throat> you're you're going into season and let's say you're looking at a, the edge of a swamp and maybe there's right outside the edge of the swamp becomes a, a high spot and there's some oaks on it. Let's say there's some oaks on it. And you're like, man, there were, there was a big deer here before, and the the rubs look two to three years old, but but say it's very apparent that there wasn't any rubs there last year. Do I, my advice would be is do not write that off at all. If anything, get excited, and this is why I used to be the guy that write it off. I would I would say, you know what, either he's dead or there's not a big one in the area anymore. But the more I've watched it. You remember what I said that maybe there's some oaks up there that just very possibly the oaks didn't produce last year, but they did two or three years ago. And if you know anything about oaks, if all of a sudden you're looking at those rubs and you're like, dude, those are two or three years old, but there wasn't anything last year. I would definitely be checking on that for early season this upcoming year. So don't don't like old historical rubs get me excited. And if they're two or three years old with with oak trees around, they even get me more excited for the upcoming year. Cause and maybe not, it may not be this upcoming year, it may not be 2024. But in 2025, then all of a sudden, like if you go another year of those oaks don't produce, oh, it's that that could be that could be dynamite. I mean, because you gotta think it, you give that buck, you know, he's right on the edge of that swamp. And he's all of a sudden he he has to come out seventy eight yards. The first acorns dropping. Then there's another bean field three hundred yards away. The bean field is never going. He's not going to get seen hard horn before before dark. But that oak tree. Guess what else is probably around that oak tree? Probably damn good scrape right there too. So that would be that would be something else for for early season. That that that's something that I've you know learned the hard way of rope places off because i thought like man it just he must have been killed or there wasn't one around here last year where it's like you know it's not always the case a lot of times it's just it's just strictly food dependent why why the sign looks like that other thing you said before we move on to is that you talked about that water's edge you know kind of if it recedes back then they're going to be further back in it's like that water creates another edge that's just another mm-hmm. edge that's created and as it moves back because the the edge of a swamp and the edge of hardwoods has its own distinctive look. And as that water recedes, it'll still look that way. You'll still be able to, you may think that's the beginning, but what you're saying, if that water's receding back, no, it's actually, there's another edge on that yep. water that you need to go back and find Yeah, and, and understand. And, yeah. And a lot of times too, you can naturally see where about a water line should be because of what what kind of vegetation is growing, what kind of brush right there. Like usually it's visually, you can see it, you know, like when, when it's leaf off in the post season, it's pretty open, but you can see it because of like the brush line, like it's a hard. And that's what, like another thing about green up. A lot of guys scared, you know, they don't want to mess with the green up, but it's like, man, when, when that vegetation does grow in the swamp, it's like a hard, man. It looks like a, it looks like a brick wall right there because of that hard edge, you know. But yeah, that, that swamp level is just constantly changing. But like you said, that water is another edge. Like that's why, like to me, even though this is a swamp, 
it doesn't matter where I go in the country. Like I'm always attracted to where multiple things come together. And that's, you know, whether it's a break in the swamp, whether it's an inside corner of a swamp, whether you got an island or maybe you got two swamps and then it's some dry ground. And it's always just, you know, whether you're in Kansas or Missouri, like you watch where multiple things come together, whether it's train features or whether it's tree rows, whether it's crop ground or like it's, they're just edge animals naturally. Yeah, which is so good to hear too, because you can actually apply maybe your area to to the swamp. You just have to like mm-hmm. change the terminology around. Yep. I mean, if you're used to hunting, you know, Nebraska, Kansas, CRP fields, I mean, it's gonna operate very similar with the edge and and where they're bedding and all of that. And CRP, they may go a little bit more in the middle, but yeah. Uh, you can use you can use as you're talking, like I'm running some ridge scenarios through my mind with where there's like huge green briar sections yep. where they're bedding and stuff like that and it kind of lines up for me as well yeah because so, it like that green briar makes it edge up you yeah. know like it's on top of a ridge you know like and you have a section of it like the, there's edges all around that green briar you know and if you just na- you just watch like naturally like hell even watch a watch a white tail in a in a bean field you know naturally they come out in a certain area for a certain reason you know they don't they don't like the monotonous stuff of things they like when it's broken up something to their advantage yeah yeah what is before we move on away from early season what is early season in your mind like if we'll use michigan as an october one start how long is early season to you before you get into like pre-rut or something yeah so so I won't even say pre rut, but to me, early season is seven days because after seven days, then then we're then we're talking about a pressured a pressured whitetail, honestly. But as soon as I so like let's say October one through seventh, like I I kind of break my seasons up into weeks. I look at windows. I I look at a lot of my whitetail hunting as windows. But so I'm going to count early season as the very first week. Because after they start applying that pressure, I don't see a lot of like historical information about spots or deer the very first like seven days of the season. But all of a sudden when October 10th rolls around, that's when I start seeing like a lot of like historical spots heat up that I've learned about or particular bucks. So like to me, first week of season, that is early season. Because after seven days, then like you you got to shift with it. Because think of this map: if I if you go into the woods October first, then you go into the woods October eighth, dude, it looks totally different. Mm -hmm. October eighth to the fourteenth looks totally different. Like every day in October, those woods are changing so much. You know, leaves are turning colors, they're dropping, some vegetation's drying out, like. It, and they're getting, you know, human pressure applied to them. Like it's, there's a lot of change going on right there, but early season for me, first week, man, that's it. That's yeah. it. So the next, the next date range that, you know, we could give an overview of would be to you the eighth through the, when's that in? Yeah. So the, the next date range would be for me is, is probably like the eighth through the 19th. And you know, it's arguably growing to be one of my, my favorite times to, to hunt actually now more particular, the 14th through the 19th, because now, now pretty much, you know, like whether I'm hunting private or public, I don't have anything I can have sole permission of. So even if I'm hunting private, they've all had the pressure applied all the neighboring properties, you know, whether it's public or private, they've all put the pressure, apply, have applied the pressure. So now the good bedding areas that I've scouted that where the sign is, because I, th- I've i actually thought about this. It's like we do all this scouting in the postseason. We're looking at all that, all that sign and outside of like them losing their velvet. Most of all that signs already being laid down once pressure's being applied. So that that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. I'm looking for pressured bedding, right? And I think naturally there's two things that are happening right then. Pressure is being applied, huge factor. And the second factor, the 14th to the 19th, I is th- this is, you know, even circling back to knowing the doe groups that are on islands in some of these swamps, is I think that October 14th through 19th is the kind of the time period that the first most mature deer doe most mature doe in some of these square miles is starting to smell good and she's starting to kind of feel herself a little bit 
And that right then, those two factors right there is why I think I start seeing some of this historical information kick in, whether it be a spot or a specific buck itself. So that is kind of my next time frame. You know, so you had opening week and then I'm kind of really buying. I don't want to say buying time because I'm not wasting hunts, but if I can get to like the 14th or 19th, if you're chasing a, a particular buck, if you're looking for like, honestly, the, the biggest, oldest buck in a square mile and that square mile's got a really nice swamp in it. And you know that he's probably been pushed into there. If you can know the doe herd in there, the doe family groups, if you can figure out what doe pops early, like most of the time, I, I believe there's one in there somewhere like that. If you can figure out where she's at, you can kill that buck during that time frame or a scrape. Cause the, she, I, I know this is a probably super hot take. I've talked about it before, but I actually think some of the, the oldest does in, in Michigan that they select what buck they would actually like to be bred by. I've, I've, I've got some pretty wild trail camera videos uh, during that time frame that that's kind of made me a believer, like seen as believing for that time frame for me. But that's my next time frame that I'm, I'm really, I'm more excited about that than I am early October, honestly, because it's, I, I know where those, the buck that I'm hunting, I know where he should be during that time frame. So you said on, you were talking about on scrapes, you could, you can hunt them on scrapes. So an individual who may, let's just say this is their first season hunting a swamp and they may not have the, the historical data that you have. It, would you say it could be a good technique for them to at least concentrate on like a really good scrape that they've, they found, you know, on a, on a uh, edge of a swamp there that that might be a, during that time period, a good yeah, way for them to, to get a shot at a, a decent buck or a good buck. Absolutely. That's, that's yeah. what I'm doing. That's a hundred percent what I'm doing. It's, it's almost, it's usually, it's usually the biggest scrape because it's got the most pulling power to it. It's usually the biggest scrape. That's the first stop for that, that buck leaving that, leaving that swamp. You know, I, I've told this story before, but what, what really opened my eyes to it was on like October 14th. And now that now this doe has done it for years, she walks by. Okay. Let's say we're, let, let's go back to our rectangle swamp. Okay. She's, she's, she's to the west of our rectangle swamp and she's walking to the east and walks through a scrape that i happen to have just a crappy camera on but it was on video mode why i didn't put it on video mode i have no clue but I, i'm so happy i freaking did she walks by this camera walking west to east and walks in the west end of the swamp okay boom she walks in there Next video, here she comes out. She's big as a horse. It's super, and she stops in that scrape mat, and she gives she she looks behind her, and you just know. And, and I'm just praying, I'm like, please let this video run long enough because I something's coming. And here comes the biggest deer I knew about in that square mile, like a, a probably like a, a truly a four and a half year old buck here in Michigan. And this is like two and a half hours before daylight, and I'm just like. Oh, and you gotta remember, I didn't know about this till after the season. I was like, oh my gosh. And I got to run another view, video mode on that, that this, this next year. Well, that, that doe has done that for three years straight. And now it's a time window. It's October 14th through 19th. And I'm not saying every scrape is like that. They're, they're, they're few and far in between. But if you can find that one, man, it's in, you got like that buck didn't care what that wind was doing that day. Cause he, she, what it looked like to me is, you know, she walked through that scrape, walked into that bedding area, found what she wanted, walked back out, walked right through the scrape, stopped, looked behind her, and here he came right after. And it's October 14th. That like, this is before time change. It's at like 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and she's doing this. And it's like, and that happened years ago, and it started really opening my eyes. And now, it, now it's like, oh, my gosh. Like, if, if you can just, you can have the right bedding area in, in no you know, these swamps, it's like, you just got to kind of know what, what is the swamp that, you know, think about this is like, if it was gun season and all the deer are going to get pushed into like the best area, what swamp is that going to be? Because mm -hmm. that's what I think happens well before gun season starts. So when that, when they feel that first initial pressure of, of hunting season, they don't know whether, you know, like obviously they don't hear gunshots, but they know human pressure is ramped up and they're going to get in there. Then they're going to start adjusting themselves from there. But like that, that time period, seeing that doe like that, 
Now I've I cover a lot of ground and I've I found three scrapes that can produce like that in that time window. And what's what was once before a, a time period of reading when I was a kid that you just you don't even hunt, you can't do any of this stuff where it's like, yeah, they they may slow down some of their movement, but if if you can kind of stay on top of them and really, really know your your doe, your doe family groups, like that like those scrapes like that without knowing adult what the doe family groups are doing in and around that swamp is i mean i wouldn't know that kind of information without them yeah i i found a similar scrape in in hill country and here in michigan and just complete luck it was just a, it was a fantastic scrape it look when you see it you kind of know it's multiple licking branches it's deep in the ground it's been there for years and threw a camera up on it and I saw, you know, really good action on probably the best buck in the area. I had ran enough cameras in the area to know kind of who was who. Yeah. And, and, you know, I only had him at night. And then all of a sudden during that three day window, probably from like the 16th to the 18th, he's in there on that, that scrape. And I, I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. I've heard you talk about this theory before. Mm-hmm. And I started thinking to myself, I'm like, yep. I yeah. wonder if he's checking on some on some does that that in that area that are are starting to heat up a little bit. I think, yeah. I ran, mean, he, ran the camera again the next year and same thing. I mean, he yeah. right around that same window time period, he yep. was there. So yeah. I mean, in in for instance too, like if if anyone if any listener if you think about if you if you've ever seen a fawn say that very first week of May. Okay, because I've I've done this because I, I came across a fawn one time on, on May 4th, right? And I've done the math back. That's October 15th, give or take a day. And that's if that fawn was born that day. So if you, you know, that first week of May, any fawn dropping is in the, the very heart of October. The very heart. And now I think it, I do believe it's the most mature doe, though, that happens like that. Now, in like your instance, like, you know, if we had never talked about this and we ran into each other at a bar and you're telling me a story, I'd be like, dude, there's a door in there. There's a door in there that's got that buck doing that, you know. But let, let's say, you know, if you were a guy, though, like, and you can't find the scrape and you're trying to hunt that 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 period of October, I honestly would be looking for one of those muddy junctions just outside of that bedding area. And you're going to have to push close because now they, like I said, they felt that pressure. They feel the human pressure and they're not like, they're going to be standing on that buffer zone. Like we talked about earlier and that, that sun's already going to be down. He's not going to move far, but if, if you don't have a scrape to hunt over, I'd find myself a break in the swamp, maybe an inside corner of the swamp. That's what I'd be looking for. Just simply trying to put yourself whatever food source you believe that they're that they're eating at that time in between that food source and that swamp bedding on some of the muddiest junctions that you can find on on a break of the edge. So moving into kind of that later October time period, do, does your technique change at all? Because it sounds like a very similar it almost sounds like scrape course, week. man. Yeah, the yeah. course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. yeah I, it's I get you know it is that that late October going into Halloween. It's such a great time for scrape week. I I do I do believe unpopular opinion scrape week should be moved up all the way to October fourteenth. I sh- I believe it should be a two week window. That's just me. No, the the late October scrape week. Yes, I think that that right there a ton of activity. But I do believe. I do believe that the biggest deer in your area, he starts using them, like I said, the, the 14th through 19th. But no, man, all the way, you know, you take you take the 14th of October all the way up to, say, Halloween-ish time. I, the tactics kind of stay the same. And I, I've never, the one thing I will say is about this style of hunting is, you know, we talked about a swamp today. Now, it, I, I've worked a long time at building a whole Rolodex of swamps like that. So I'm constantly bouncing a, a lot around a lot of places. So it's not, I'm not just, I don't keep pounding just one swamp like that. I'm doing this at a lot of places. So like every time I go in, it's kind of like a fresh brand new sit at a brand new property, public or private on the South side, North side, it doesn't new scrape, you know, like that, that's kind of the name of my game. So as much as it sounds like that, you know, yes, I am doing the same thing from, you know, the middle of October to the very end of October, it's constantly on fresh, new, good stuff. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, we started off the conversation by saying, hey, there's a guy that's traveling. He's only got a week. But honestly, most likely if he's he's not traveling during that time period, we're all going to sure. save it up for yep. you know either the last you know part of October, first part of November or even into that second week of November. So if you're using those, there it's probably someone who's just moving into a swamp for the first time. They've got it, yeah. either a new piece or they're they found public by their house. I'm thinking of so many areas of actual like swamp that I have overlooked just on some public near my house mm-hmm. for whatever reason. I don't I don't hunt a ton by my house. I'm I'm traveling more, but just having these conversations and and thinking about deer that have disappeared from camera and even they've disappeared a mile and a half, two miles from the swamp. I'm now thinking, okay, that's where I need to actually put up some more cameras, it, which is, I should have thought about it, but I just didn't until now what we're talking yeah. about. <laughs> but something to be said about walking up now that we're saying that, the, hey, they're bedded. And uh, are you saying a lot of times they're bedded just on the inside of that swamp? Looking yeah, for, for like the end of October time yeah. frame. Yeah, yeah, it's it's and it's very much dependent on like, a, and I know I've referred to it a couple of times, but that that water level is going to kind of yeah. push them to or from, you know, but they're they're you know, once they once they are inside the swamp map is is though the biggest oldest buck, they do have like destination beds yep. in there and it's not they don't lay in the same one every night, but they're like if you're ever out scouting in some of these swamps like there you ever come across and you're like dude this looks like the king's bed in here that's probably his bed he's probably got two or three other ones like that so i'll see a lot of like some of the the younger bucks on that on that interior edge but the usually like the big buck that i'm after he'll be in there a little bit more yeah. because he's going to utilize those those younger deer to exit and then he's going to utilize that buffer on that very edge before he exits so he could be in there i mean he could be in there a poke but even though even though it feels like he's in there quite a ways remember like there's always edge around so you know what may feel like a long walk where he's you know from rear hunting to where he's at like he can escape a back door that may only be 55 yards off the other edge so it's very very dependent but yeah i that the pretty much once i get to that that second week of october all the way to halloween i'm i'm kind of hunting that that same kind of scenario so you have eyes on you as you're walking in i mean you got to think that as you're entering mm-hmm. into your stand location and so i would i mean it's goes without saying that you have to be as stealthy as possible when definitely has to be in your favor. You can't risk it at this point of time in the season that we were just talking about. And, and you've got to really maneuver quietly and, and use as much cover as you can to your advantage to get into your, your, your tree. And then I would imagine you're using the right height of the tree based on cover. You're not going to all of a sudden mm-hmm. skyline yourself over top where everybody can see you that are, yeah. that's bedded on that edge. So, so now that we're getting into that more like pre rut rut time period, does anything change there? I mean, you're, you're on the edge still. Yeah. Before we get into that, you, you brought up about the, the stealthiness. I I'd love to talk about this yeah. real quick. Make sure we cover this because I, I think it's such an overlooked part is, you know, as we get deeper into like, say, Halloween and kind of going into that first week of November, which honestly, like not to get too sidetracked, like October, or November 1st through 5th is a is a time period that I, I've struggled with quite a bit right there. Like, I, I don't know what it is. Like, I, I'd rather take off the last week of October, go to work the first week of November, than take the second week of November. Off. It's I just agree. just a time period I struggle with. But as we go, you know, as we're like, probably honestly, once we get towards like that 25th, 26th, 27th of of October going into November, then I find myself usually like, that means, you know, we're we're at the tail end of October. We probably had some rain. The water levels are coming up that I find myself like now we're, now we're actually hunting in the water quite a bit, like nine out of 10 times we're in the water. But I, I, this is what I want to hit on about being stealthy when you're hunting swamp country like this this is one thing that i I would highly suggest to people once you've entered the water don't ever if you can don't ever actually take your feet up out of the water if you do not have to kind of like imagine being at the beach and it's like knee deep or like say ankle deep water 
Every time you pick pick your boot up and you get heavy hunting boots, every time you pick it up, it breaks the water, and that water sits there and drops off your boot. And then you, every time you put your boot da- back down, it breaks it again, and it has a noise to it. If you can just keep your feet in the water and just kind of shuffle them as you go through the swamp, it's way more quieter, and there's no cadence to that. Like when 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 an animal like walks, like when I talked about hearing a whitetail come through the water, like they have such a cadence. Like I can almost tell you how many deer are coming through the water because of the cadence of it. Well, that's what those, those deer are constantly listening for something to come through that water. That's why like a lot of times, if you ever see a coyote in the swamp, they don't love the water, but a lot of times they, co- they work across the logs because it's dead silent for them to get in there. So that was, I just, you talked about being stealthy. That, that is uh, something that I want to hit on is try to, if you can keep both of your boots underwater and just kind of shift your feet. And it's not like it, the way I say it may sound like it, it's difficult, but it's not, it's pretty easy to do in the swamp. But so I'm kind of getting, you know, I'm usually pushing deeper into, into the swamps, but as we roll into November and now maybe, maybe I'm not hunting, hunting technically right over the scrapes because i i think that's why part of part of why that say november 1st through 5th i struggle a little bit is is because i i do see a lot of my scrapes right outside the the swamp slow down a little bit a lot of times i've you know like i said this has been done from a lot of scouting but if i can find like two swamps that are pretty close to each other that has some high ground in between them Oh man, I, I love, I love hunting areas like that as I, you know, get towards Halloween all the way into like that first and second week in November. That's a killer, you know, cause a lot of times you're just, it's the shortest travel. Say if a buck is working from once, you know, one bedding area to the other on the downwind side, just knowing like if, you know, if the, the wind's blowing out of the North, we want to be on the South side of the, where those two swamps kind of connect each other that that's really dynamite and then you know another tactic during that time of year is we kind of circle back to knowing if there's some does betting on some certain islands if you know there's some does betting on islands like get getting downwind of those islands because he is going to come check those islands sometime during the day hopefully it's during daylight but he he is going to come check some of those and then i i here's another tactic and i'll try to, to paint the best picture as possible let's say We'll take that same rectangular swamp, but let's say our our hardwoods is starting to get a little bit flooded on each end of it, but then you kind of have what looks like a finger that kind of leads up into the south side of that swamp, okay? And if you can get like a good north, northwest, northeast side or wind, man, I I find a a lot of bucks will, if they want to go up into that into the bedding area into that swamp because that swamp's going to hold more than just bucks and does these are big swamps like it's got all kinds of bedding in it that they'll travel up that finger and you know like if you got a northwest wind just put yourself on the east side of that finger if you got a northeast wind put yourself on the west side of that finger where he's kind of basically like he's and that that's mainly for a morning hunt like he's like he's been out on his feet all night long and he wants us to come up in that bedding area and he wants to see who like, okay, who laid down? Like this is going to be at nine, 10 o'clock in the morning. He finally comes to like, you're going to hear him coming from a mile away through the dry leaves. And it's like I said, we got this rectangular swamp and it's, it's kind of been, the water's been pushing out, but he's got a little bit of a, just a dry, it's like a dry strip of land that's kind of leading right up in there. They love to travel, travel right up through that and just kind of position yourself. It's going to feel like the wind's going to blow right at them, but you're going to be just kind of off, off on that edge. Is that a little bit of the thinking there that it's more about ease of travel than it is cover or I don't know. Am I off a little bit? Well, the, the, my thought process on, let's say if I, if I, if I backed off the swamp. Okay. And this, this would be the reason why is let's say we talked about having this rectangular swamp. Now let's, let's have two of those now, but let's, let's make them 150 yards apart from each other, but they're exactly like kind of they're east and west of each other, but they're 150 yards apart from each other that in, in the reason I I talk about, I talked about that is uh, this is how I, I killed my biggest deer I've ever killed here in Michigan where 
this deer was, he was getting the best of me. You know, when I, when I zigged, he zagged, when I zagged, he zigged, it seemed like it, it was back and forth. And it finally got to the point, Matt, that I, I knew, I knew he was working two swamps and it always seemed to be like, if I was in, if I was on one swamp, he was on the other one. And if I went to the other one, he'd end up in the other, this other one. And it finally got to the point that, uh, November 5th rolled around and I, you know, for us guys in Michigan, you know, that you basically have 10 days before, for gun season. And I've been applying plenty of pressure along with, there's about 11 other guys that were applying pressure to, and er, everyone kind of knew about the deer in the area. And it, I finally got to the point, I says, I know he'll come be, between these two swamps sooner or later. The, it's just whether or not he's going to do it in daylight. That's going to be what I'm going to battle. And so I set up November 5th and I had two different ways I could access it. And I had, so basically like with having two different ways of accessing it, and as long as we didn't have like a straight east or straight west wind, anything out of the north, anything out of the south, I just would bounce from one side to the other with access both ways. Well, you know, and in one way was terrible to access, like just with how hard it was compared to the other way. But hey, either way, I like I had a lot to play with here. And this was hard, like you get my mindset right being so mobile, it's like I, but it, like, this was the type of deer that I was like, I, I'm going to sit here for 10 days. And cause he, like, I was so convinced my scouting told me that like, just knowing this area, just knowing like, eventually he's going to come through here. Luckily on day one, he, he had came right through there and it was like, you know, that was on November 5th and that, so that's after time change. And it was like an hour and a half before daylight, just all by himself come right through. He's going to work one bed into the other. He was directly on the downwind side and it just opened my eyes up where it's like, I wonder how many other times that I've, I've chased box that it's like, sometimes you just got to simply like get in between the, the two best bedding areas that, you know, of now they're pretty close. If those are a mile apart, that's a whole different world. But, you know, we're talking 150, 175 yards apart between the two swamps just to, just happens to be some high ground. You would think there'd be like a really good scrape there for some reason there just isn't. But I feel like, you know, watching the deer travel back and forth, especially the bucks during the rut, that that spot right there, like you just you have to know, though, like that's only good during the rut. That's mm-hmm. only a really good rut spot. Like you go sit there all you want early season. You may see some small bucks and some does, but you're you're not going to kill the big one. But that was good. That's kind of honestly my my philosophy, why I put myself in between the two. I, I was ready to ride out a, a 10 day hunt in there, man. I was like, I, I had hung my stand. I was like, I'm, I'm going to sit here for 10 days, you know, and I'll just bounce back and forth depending on what, what, what way the wind direction was. But that was a, that's just a very situational scenario though, that the work like that. How are you seeing bucks travel in just say the one rectangle? Let's say you don't have another swamp mm-hmm. during that time period. Are you still right on that edge then catching them? You know, just running that edge downwind, seeing if there's any does bedded in there. Yep. You're right on the edge still. Yep. You're, yeah. You're going to see them yep. right on that edge. Now, the question is, is are they going to be on the interior or the exterior of the edge? Okay. Yep. If it's the middle of the day, I see them more in the interior kind of working them. Now you get that last, like, you know, in the, a lot of times it's like in the, for a morning hunt, they've been out all night long and they'll work that exterior kind of looking for a place to cut in. And because there's going to be some does in there, like they're not usually working those until they, I think they kind of have a time sense of when those does have filtered back in there. Right. And in the evenings, like say if it's after time change, so it's like, say it's, a, it's a hard, it's dark at six. Like I'm not seeing them on that exterior cruising trail till maybe like 4 30 PM or later. Otherwise it kind of keeps them inside. And the, you know, the best case scenario is I, I kind of love, you know, once, once the Halloween time hits, I love to be kind of in the interior of it. But we also means that leaves have dropped. So now I can at least visually see both. Because here's one thing I've watched about the, these cruising trails. Let's say if, let's say you're just off and you've seen one cruise it and it's, it's November 7th. 
I would be right back. I would, I would adjust for November 8th because, boy, if if most likely he'll probably, if he didn't find anything that night, he'll probably work that same one because, they, like I said, these swamps hold a lot of deer. They, this isn't individual like buck bedding. There's multiple bucks bedding there, a lot of does bedding there. So if that buck that you're after, if you're just off, make your adjustment, maybe even make it that night, slip in there the next morning and just hang on tight because he's probably going to come back through. If not him, like there, there's a lot of bucks that use these trails like that. But the best case scenario is of maybe being in that interior and being able to see both and even possibly, possibly being able to shoot both. But I'd rather be in the interior after Halloween if, if I can be. Okay, good. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot here. Now we go into late. Is there anything for rut during that rut period that you want to hit on that we didn't talk about? No, not much. Don't be surprised if if you see a buck, bird, you know, kind of bird dog a doe up into an island, and don't get too discouraged because if if a buck can get a doe up on one of those islands, they'll probably be there forty eight seventy two hours. Just you know, all you can do is hope and pray that when 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 they're done, that he kind of heads your way. But it, that can be discouraging. I, I I hunted a buck one year that I watched him take a doe up onto this island. Hunted that I hunted that spot for three days. Sat and watched those the buck and the doe for three days straight. And finally, when when he was done, he just went off the complete opposite way. And I was like, dude, like <laughs> I was so convinced. I was like, if I just put my time and he's coming my way, but like they they love to take those does on those little islands and just get them pinned down because I think they can really fight off the other bucks really, really well. One, they can visual or they can hear a lot of the other bucks coming through the water and it kind of like they put the put that doe up on that pedestal on that island and kind of force all the other bucks off of it but that that's that's kind of pretty much it for the rut you know and the one thing that could change all of this and i'm sure this will probably lead right into the late season part the one thing that can change all of this stuff if it gets cold early and if if you get some ice on top of that water. The one I have found is either they want open water or they want ice where they can stand on it. If they are punching through with their legs every time, they don't like it. And unless you force them in it, like say they're on dry ground and you, you know, you bump them, they'll run through it. They don't, but they won't stay in it. They do not like that you know, and I, I get it. Like I watch my dog when we're out postseason scout. And if he's breaking through the ice, watch him, how he picks his legs up and stuff. He doesn't like that. And I don't think those deer like that either. So if it gets cold on you, if it's November 10th and all of a sudden you start, that swamp starts freezing over that, that could completely change what they're doing. Like you, and you better be shifting with them. Man, that was great. Yeah. Really good. Cause that is something that likely can happen. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it's been so many years now where it's actually been like 60 or 70 during yeah. that time period. Yeah. You're like, what's going on? Yeah. That, that, that's, that, that's one right there where it's like, it, it's unreal that, cause when you see it happen, what was once, you know, our, you know, could be some of the best bedding that you know about can be a ghost town overnight. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they do, they either want it rock solid where they can walk on it or they want to open water or unless you force them in it. And then they'll, they'll, you know, obviously they, that, that's their fail safe is to always dump off into these swamps. Yeah. Yeah. The next one, the next part, late season is going to be a little difficult just because it really is based on, I imagine food where it's mm-hmm. at I me. Mean, of course the swamp is that bedding, but, and it does provide, I would assume most swamps provide, you know, enough food just based off of what's in there, browse, but I would also imagine it has to depend on on what fields are still up at during that time, if they are still up. I mean, if every field's down, I would imagine a swamp would be still active really nice. If if all of a sudden you've got a cornfield that's still up down the road and everything else has been cut down, do you ever see that change where they shift over to the food? Are they still kind of saying, you know what, there's enough browse here that I can live here, browse here, and at night I can travel? I don't know. Yeah. What's so, been your experience? Yeah. So what I see is, is still the best swamps will always still hold the best bedding areas, like, which are going to still hold the best deer. I haven't, you know, I've actually seen them travel a long ways in the evenings to go get that food. If their swamp is so good. And I, you know, a lot of that's based off of human pressure, you know, and, 
I, I can think of an example years ago where it was like, I, I couldn't believe I, I had seen this buck that I knew I was, I was hunting and I, I seen him cross the road in front of me and I had to stop and think, Oh my gosh, he's so far. But then like the following day, like I, I went to check on him in the morning and he was headed right back where it was like the food was, the food was so good for him to travel, but his bed was also so good for him to travel or like he was, he was willing to travel like that. But you know, like I said, that the thing with late season is all going to be dependent on what that, that what that ice is doing. You know, is it going to support them or is it not? And if it's uh, honestly, if it's kind of warmer in the late season, even though that's the opposite of what most you know real good late season conditions are, the swamps will hold them longer because that's the thing is like it has to freeze good enough so they're going to vacate it for a little bit. So when they're when they're when they left. Like it all depends on what kind of human pressures happen since that, or have they found something better, you know, or like, you know, we, we keep talking about the water levels. If there's a year that the water levels are really far down and they don't have to walk through that water, like they're never that, that swamp is like, they're going to use that thing all year round, you know, and that, that goes all the way back to that early season thing. The water levels are down the there is there almost becomes no edge for them now they're deep into that swamp you know but yeah so late season and i'll be honest like i i i mean no how it is in michigan man it's usually like november 15th it's it's it totally changes the one thing that i have seen through uh trail cameras uh, a lot of information is you get into this is mainly like december 2nd through the 8th I've i've seen this a lot if you get like kind of that first good snow, so hopefully maybe that swamp otters froze, is some of those scrapes on those islands can be can be productive again. And I'm guessing that's ha- having to do with like maybe a, a late doe going in estrus or maybe even a fawn. But I I want to I won't don't be surprised if come the late season if they don't kind of get pushed more towards that outer edge again, depending on what that ice does. The ice is dictates everything to me mm-hmm. outside of pressure in the late season, what they're going to do there. Awesome, man. Is there anything else, you know, it's so tough on these podcasts, you know, when we mm-hmm. talk about trying to explain what a swamp looks like or tactics in there. And I think really people just have to take it as a starting point and, and really get in there. You talked about, you're going to have to bump some deer Mm -hmm. at times, especially if you're moving in on that edge, it's going to happen. And, you know, don't be afraid of it. Like it's a learning, it's a learning opportunity every time it happens. But is there anything else that we can give that needs to be given to the listener? Or do you think we've covered everything? No, I, I would say one more, one more really, really important thing about, about swamps guys is you've heard us talk a lot about this hard edge, you know, kind of where that the edge is usually where the water line is a lot of times with the swamp. Well, swamps are stagnant, okay? They're mucky. And I would I would advise anyone to do this if you're starting to hunt swamps, you better start carrying some milkweed with you because the thing about stagnant water, it's usually warm, right? that sun is baking on those swamps all the time. So if, if, when it comes to wind and thermals, a lot of these swamps I have, they, they're they not moving water. They just sit and still. So they have a lot of pulling power in the evenings when it comes to thermals. And that is, you know, we talked about earlier why that buck is standing there on that buffer on that very edge. Okay. What happens is, as the temperature drops in the evening, when the sun starts to go down and starts to cool off and you got to put your, you know, your, your sweatshirt on that swamp water is still warm. And so it's pulling a lot of scent into that swamp. Mm. That's what gives that buck such a, such an advantage on that buffer of that edge. And so you, you gotta, you gotta remember that, that, you know, we, there's a lot of people that talk about, you know, what rivers do and what streams and creeks and all that and thermals, thermals and hill country. That's why it's a lot of times, like I hear guys talk about thermals and hill country, you know, where it's like, you know, they talk about, you know, like the, what the wind does on, on the leeward side or this and that, or it's like, it's these swamps do the same thing on these edges where the water is like that. They just sit and, you know, swirl or swirl right there especially like you gotta think you could have a wind right in your face say if you're on the if you're on the you have a south wind and you're on the north side of this swamp 
south wind, right? Perfect wind and right in your face. All of a sudden, when that sun goes down and all that in its flat topography, all of a sudden that when that sun goes down, that swamp water is so freaking warm from baking in the sun all day, especially early season. All of a sudden, then your thermals are getting pulled right back to that swamp. And guess who's standing there on the edge? And here's the one thing I'll tell you about a big buck in a swamp is if as long as you don't basically slap him on his ass and if he figures something's not right he will not run away he will simply turn around and quietly walk away no other animal re- will really even know if something was wrong there so that was that's one thing i would i would just kind of tell people too is is you know you, you really have to learn what the thermals do in the swamp because that you know as the season goes on that water gets colder so it can have it could you know all of a sudden it's, it's november 10th and you have a a really like say if it's a, a 60 degree day that swamp water is going to be pushing the scent away because now it's been say it's been cold around halloween and now it's going to be pushing it away but yeah i just i just want to cover that part real quick to don't don't overlook the thermal in the swamp because even though it's flat they they can be tricky this is where it's tough if you didn't do the the pre-scouting ahead of time to know mm-hmm. how those trails run throughout the swamp. Yep. Because I would imagine the the simple answer is, well, as I get to my stand, I'm I'm dropping milkweed, seeing how it's, well, even then it's, it's going to be different too because as it gets cooler, but as it gets cooler, I'm dropping milkweed, seeing how my wind is being effective. I'm just going to set down on the opposite side of the trail where my wind is being blown away, but... Mm-hmm. He may be coming from that direction too, as he's winding through the swamp. So, I would say I you have done a lot of podcasts on on scouting swamps, and and everybody knows who you are by now. I'm sure I want to get into your podcast as well. Which, if anybody listens to mine, they've already listened to yours. But mm-hmm. so, just to Google your name, and it's going to come up all of these really good scouting podcasts that you've done. It is important to do that. You know, we're, we're kind of talking about it, someone who hasn't had that chance to do that. But the, the reality is it's going to be tough hunting swamps your first time mm-hmm. if you haven't done this, the, but still go do it. Don't shy away from it because I think you'll learn if you plan on hunting swamps going forward. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. No, I, I, I agree. You know, and it, I started somewhere, you started somewhere, like everyone's got to start somewhere. And, and as long as I, I think, you know, and maybe if you listen to today and you're like, man, that that's a, that's a lot of years of like trying to learn, learn his craft or it's like, you, you just got to get out there, go get dirty, go do it. And, and, but think of it like this, think of it in the long term. Like what, what could it look like three years from now? If I, maybe if I got two trail cameras and if I'll go set them out on two different exit trails and junctions and maybe learn what, what could those cameras tell me in three years and, and then me hunting it, like, what could I I tell myself in you know in three years what would I have learned? Well, I've killed the deer. What would I have seen? You know, or I I think that's the big thing is is I think if if you're a new guy getting into it, kind of think of it as like the long play. Like this is a long play. Like don't I know we all want results. You know, tomorrow like I want my bank account to look totally different tomorrow morning when I wake up. It's just not going to right. But I I it's a long play of trying to get that to change. And I, I kind of play that with my with my hunting too, but I, I can fully understand for a guy that's just getting into it and kind of wanting results now, like you you have to be you have to be okay with with you know one failing. You know, like I I don't like to fail, but I'm okay with it, you know, because it's like I always tell my kids this all the time. It's like if I learn something or if you learn something from failing fail and it's not really a failure in my opinion you know so i think you just gotta get out there and go get after it and think of it in a long-term game like think about down the road what maybe maybe you'll be sitting here talking about you know swamps yeah yeah for sure i i wish i could have beat that into the younger version of me i was so focused on no i need to just kill a buck this year right now and i i think it held me back and so now i'm 47 and i'm and i'm thinking long term now you know, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking, yep. okay, you know, and all right, maybe I got 20 years left of being able to do this. And, and maybe I got 15 years left of doing it at the level that I can do it now. But it's still really important for me to think three, four, five years down the road now. Yeah. Um, I just wish I would have done that when I was in my 20s. Yeah. Uh, so if you're <laughs> listening back then and you're thinking, no, nah, I don't want to listen to these old guys say that. No, no, no. You really need to because, you, you know, three years is going to be here in a blink of an eye and you'll be so yep. much further ahead. You yeah. Know? 
No, I, I agree with you, man. I, I think about that a lot too, because it's like even like I think back about like let's just say school sports, you know. When you're in school and high school, you just want to, you know, get, you know, don't want to really practice and you just kind of want to get ready for the games or then you get it, you get to a certain point when you get older and you're like, dude, I would be the hardest working dude at practice if I could do it all over again. You know, where it's like now it's, it's the same concept, right? We're like, you know, when we're talking about scouting and stuff, it's like scouting is the practice and the, you know, hunting season's the game where it's like, I, I would work my ass off all year to be able to get in the game again. Oh yeah, for sure, man. A lot of shoulda, coulda, would is and mm-hmm. when you get older, I think you finally finally starts to sink in. You're like, okay, like I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do it for the future now. So you you do have a podcast that mm-hmm. I'm sure a few people have heard. It's it's probably I said that jokingly. It's like one of the most popular podcasts out there right now. And you've only been doing it for how long now? How many episodes do you have? So I'd be. I don't know when this will drop, but I've, I've only got 10 episodes because I, I only do an every other week kind of thing. So that's a 10 yep. episodes so far. And that's a Latitudes, the method podcast. Yeah. And it's a awesome podcast. If you guys enjoyed, you know, the deep, like next level conversation that we had today on, on some things. I mean, that's what it's like mm-hmm. the whole time when you're listening to the method podcast. It's one that I listen to every time it gets dropped and really enjoy it. I've been listening to every podcast that you've been on for, you know, you know, a couple of years now. And so it's, it's a f- awesome podcast. When, how often does it drop? You said it's every other. So how can guys look for it? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah. So it, it drops every other Wednesday. So like I, you know, I, Right now, I got one coming up. It'd be July 10th. So then two weeks after that, two weeks after that. But you can head on over to, uh, you can find it anywhere on any of the podcast platform, Latitudes, the Method Podcast. We have an Instagram page for it. And uh, also, you can find it over at latitudeoutdoors.com. It's over there on the homepage and you can find it there also. You guys are putting out some of the best stuff out there right now, just in the podcast and with the fall. And then mm-hmm. also, on the YouTube channel, you know, the, the hunting videos that are coming out there are just really awesome. So I'm excited Appreciate to it. see what you guys are putting out, you know, coming up and, I definitely listen to it every time it drops. So I really appreciate you coming on and being able to share some of that here and with my listeners. And I'm, like I said, I'm pretty sure all of them already listen to you. So yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if you'll gain any from, from me, but they'll yeah. definitely, maybe one yeah. or two. You know, man, I, I appreciate you having me on and, and, you know, especially talking about swamps and swamps here in Michigan. I'm just, I'm just passionate about it, man. I love it. I'm kind of long winded. I think that's becomes, you know, part of being passionate, you know, but hopefully someone could get, you know, a little bit of information from this. And if anyone has any questions, just, just reach out and make sure I talk to anyone that has a question. Um, I, I started to, and, and maybe, and maybe someone that's listening, they, they have some information for me that I, I'd love to hear back from, but I really appreciate you having me on buddy and keep up the good work over here. Yeah. I appreciate it. And where can they reach out to you one more time? Where can they yeah, find you? Can fi- you can find me over at Latitudes, the method podcast, or my personal, in- our Instagram page is uh, D Riley Jr. You can uh, message me on there also. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming out and thanks to everybody else for coming out to the dojo. We'll be back next Thursday with another Whitetail Master, and until then, embrace the journey.